Thank you for joining me on this interview, Gila. I really appreciate it. I'm so, so beautifully happy to be here. Um, I guess we'll just hop right into it. So the first question that I came up with was, who or what was your first inspiration to become an artist? And do they still inspire you today? Um, I absolutely love that question. And it's Strangely, not um, a well-known figure. Okay. Uh, I guess not strangely. Probably a lot of people have these kind of people in their life. My parents, um, and it's not my parents, but my parents, uh, who are wonderful parents, always had a kind of um, little circle of artistic friends. They love artists. They themselves are not professional artists, but they've all they they always had writers and poets and painters and musicians as friends. It was kind of this close-knit circle of friends. And uh, one of the best friends for years uh, that my parents had had, uh, she no longer is alive, but she still is an inspiration for me and, uh, and a source of l kind of creative light. Uh, her name was Milka Chizik. She was, um, I guess, a pretty well-known uh, visual artist in Israel and um, her her art was really unique very um, very much her own I, I, I don't even know how to describe it uh, she she had she was also a very well even more well-known arts teacher in one of the kind of big art institutions in, in, in art institutions in Israel and there was, it wasn't just her art. She was one of these human beings that lived life in a way that you looked at her and recognized somebody who just figured out how to live their life. And like a piece of art, she lived her life like a piece of art. She, she was full of personality. She had the funniest voice because she had smoked for many, many years. So she had a voice like this. Um, the most exuberant laughter, she would always laugh. She would collect all kinds of things from her walks around the neighborhood and make little pieces of art in her house from them. She would tell us all these fantastical and real stories as kids because I really grew up with this person. Uh, she was like a surrogate aunt that just lit up our imagination, made us completely full of interest and, um, and and there was something very unique about the way that she lived her life. Yeah. And, yeah. And then, she, uh, and later in life, she, she just, she became a very, a very close person to me in, in terms of anybody who I needed to go to for help or inspiration or advice. And, um, and more than that, in my heart, whenever I needed kind of a source of knowing that life, that a life of creation is okay, I would, I think on her and I know. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's beautiful. She sounds like somebody that everybody would love to know. Yeah. So was there any specific artistic creation of hers that comes to memory about her? Or is it just kind of like a spectrum of experiences that you had it's so funny because i actually have some of her artwork uh hanging here in my house but the the main <laughs> so she illustrated some children's books that were published in israel that were also pretty popular and there was one where she always painted these weird people with huge heads and small bodies okay. and there was one story that for some reason, all of my life, and I still, it was called small big, but for a girl, small big. In, the, in the Hebrew, you can kind of do the gender thing with, with the language. So, and it was about this girl, this little girl 
who, you know, she shows what it is that her parents, they help her with her food and with her clothes and they tell her what to do. And then she goes to sleep and she wakes up and all of a sudden she's huge and her parents are these little figurines. Mm -hmm. And she's the one that's having to take care of them and all. And I, I would, she would read it for me and I, I read it a lot. And there was also something about that kind of weird, that balancing of um, childhood and responsibility and knowing what you want out of life and but also not and kind mm -hmm. of was in that story it was a story for kids and yet it always made me have the strangest feeling about wait you don't have to be one or the other you can kind of be both yeah know? so yeah that sounds like a great story um so the next question that i have is how have you evolved as an artist over the years? Like what's something that you look back on and it might not be a negative or could be a positive, something that you just see like, man, I've really grown in this aspect or these multiple aspects. Wow, Spencer, thank you for these beautiful questions. Hmm. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's funny, I think, for many artists, and I can't talk to uh, to everyone's experience, but there's something that parallels whatever you're going through life. Yeah. And one of the things that's grown for me in a way, I used to want to kind of show my emotion or my light or what I what was important to me as an idea of almost like a struggle. Like I'm showing it in order to prove or to show others what is right or to really stand up for what I believe. These kind yeah. of things. Uh -huh. And as I've grown, the, the, I recognize that the struggle is really an indication of kind of an inner, <laughs> inner struggle. And I've let go of a lot of that struggle. Mm-hmm. And it can be the same piece and it can be the, 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 the deepest intensity and still or the deepest sorrow or joy or whatever it is. But I'm not trying to, in a sense, like proselytize. Whoever wants to join into the, into the essence of what I'm saying is welcome. And if there's somebody else who doesn't connect, that's absolutely fine. Yeah. And if I don't. That, and that's been a real, a, a real um, kind of jewel uh, that I'm grateful for. That's come with with some <laughs> somehow the you know goddess of wisdom putting that into my my system. When you had come to Fredonia uh, to do the masterclass a couple of years ago, I remember you specifically saying that somebody had been performing for the audience rather than performing. For themselves like that's two different ways of performing so is that like kind of the shift that you're talking about like instead of performing for the people like almost if you build it they will come rather than you know that kind of that kind of idea it just gave me chills my goodness um that's one of my favorite movies by the way uh first thank you for remembering what i said in the class <laughs> the master class in fredonia like i mean that's amazing and yes absolutely that that is kind of a foundational block a elemental block of that exact thing and it's not in a way where you're just doing it for yourself you know it's not you you're including and you love the audience and there's a love that's being shared but you're just not trying to change anybody's mind or exactly or put on a show mm -hmm. you're just trying to be as real as you can within that's that kind of sacred space mm -hmm. and um and really that's it not even beyond that that's that's the whole thing yeah so that kind of like ties into what we have talked about previously about your approach to music when you say that you're not doing it for the numbers you're not doing it for anything else but to enrich people's lives and and move them you know, whether or not it's for five people in your living room or for 10,000 people in an auditorium or concert hall, yeah. right? 
Yes, absolutely. And it, again, that's not with a struggle too. It's not like I won't do it for 10,000 people. Absolutely. You know, it's just, it's, yeah, you, I mean, you get it. Um, it's in the way that where I'm coming from is really hoping to be as pure as I can in my, in my want to, to kind of express the, the, the beauty that I see and share it with whoever is around. I think that's a really beautiful evolution as an artist. And I think that a lot of people can relate to that as not only artists, but also 